When an engineer studies a schematic diagram, the lines that connect components are often called nodes, and the engineer treats the node as though all points connected to the node have the same potential at the same time. And for many circuit boards, and for most circuits, that's a pretty good first-order approximation. Whether the node represents a time-varying analog signal or a binary digital state, unless the trace is very long or the frequencies involved are high, we can all just pretend that impedance mismatches and lossy signal propagation and reflections just don't exist. So, what about wires that are, let's say, several meters long and frequencies north of one gigahertz? Well then, the output of the transmitter and the input of the receiver, even if they are connected by a piece of wire, are most certainly not the same node. And the wire is no longer just a wire, it's a transmission line. And signals applied to the transmission line aren't just applied, they're launched. So, no. You won't just connect some arbitrary output to the cable and expect those multi-gigabit signals to arrive unmolested at the receiver. You're going to need a different logic class. Now think about it. Old-style TTL worked just fine on a circuit board. The driver would present about 3.5 volts for a logic 1, and the receiver would expect about 2 volts. Plenty of margin. On the low side, the driver would typically drive the output to no more than four-tenths of a volt, and the input would expect a signal of less than eight-tenths. Again, we have plenty of margin. But in between, there was a no-man's land. It was just unpredictable what would happen if the signal remained between 0.8 and 2 volts for very long. And at the end of a long cable with fast transitions, you might just see that condition. Another problem with old-style TTL is that the totem pole output wasn't symmetrical in its drive strength. It could drive low much more strongly than it could pull high. In a high-speed environment, that practically meant that the leading edge would rise more slowly than the trailing edge would fall. CMOS drivers and receivers with hysteresis would seem to fix both problems, the C in CMOS stands for complementary, and since opposite polarity transistors are used to pull up and pull down the outputs, the drive strength is nearly symmetrical, and many CMOS devices have inputs with hysteresis. So, great, just use CMOS, right? The problem is speed. Conventional CMOS has a propagation delay measured in tens of nanoseconds, and we're trying to drive a signal north of one gigabit. See the problem? And newer versions of CMOS do have much lower propagation delays, but still not nearly fast enough for our use. No, we need a new logic class. Current mode logic. CML. Now, just one observation before we go into detail. CML is not like TTL or CMOS. It's not a standard logic family. It's not as though there's a whole catalog of CML gates and flip-flops and driver-receiver pairs. CML is more of a technology, but for driving high-speed signals down a transmission line, it's a really useful technology. Here's a typical CML driver. In operation, only one of the transistors, Q1 or Q2, are on at any given time. And that means current can flow through the resistor associated with the off transistor to the output pin and into the transmission line. Meanwhile, current from the transmission line comes through the other output pin and through the on transistor down through the current source. At the receiving side, the cable is terminated in its characteristic impedance, 50 ohms for coax and usually 100 ohms for shielded twisted pair. The data is recovered in a differential receiver across the terminating resistor. Well, that seems easy enough. But I'm going to toss in one more wrinkle. The output of the CML driver is capacitively coupled to the cable and the CML receiver is also capacitively coupled to the cable. Wait, I thought this was current mode logic. Don't capacitors block the current? <laughs>
Not at all. Capacitors block direct current. We have absolutely no intention of driving direct current from the transmitter to the receiver. Why not? Well, any logic class defines conditions for a one state and a zero state. In logic classes based on voltage levels, the voltage levels that define a one state and a zero state are always referenced to a common ground potential. A one state might be defined as, let's say, any voltage above 2.4 volts. And a zero state might be defined as any voltage below 0.8 volts referenced to ground. But in an automotive environment, what's ground at the ECM may not be ground at the rear bumper. Worse, the ground at the rear bumper may be extremely noisy compared to what the vehicle considers to be true ground. It's better if you can let the ECM and the peripheral reference to their own grounds. If the logic signal we launch onto the cable is AC with no DC component, we can capacitively couple both the transmitter and the receiver, and then the receiver can bias the incoming signal as necessary to put the signal transitions right in the voltage sweet spot. Notice that so far we've treated the CML drivers and receivers as a differential pair because, you know, that's what they are. But there's no law that says you have to use both outputs or inputs. And in fact, if you're using coax as your medium, you will use only one output and one input. But that introduces a few complications of its own. First, what do you do with the other input and the other output? Well, to minimize EMI and signal degradation, it's important that both output pins and both input pins see the same impedance. You do that by terminating the unused output and the unused input with a series RC network. The resistor should match the impedance of the cable, usually 50 ohms, and the capacitor should be the same value as the one you use to couple the output to the coax. Now we have to talk about ground. Remember what we just said about the serializer and the deserializer having their own ground potential? Well, with coax, that kind of goes out the window. The problem occurs when you ground both ends of the coax shield. Now you have two ground paths, one through the frame of the vehicle and a second path through the shield of the coax. In RF engineering, we call this a ground loop. So what? Well, this can be a very big deal because any noise developed along the normal ground path through the frame of the car will likely find a path home through the coax shield, and that can cause noise voltage to develop in the receiver, generate enough noise voltage, and you can easily overwhelm the ability of the receiver to recover the signal. What to do? Well, there's an old radio trick that works very well here. Leave the shield ungrounded at the transmitter end. That would be at the camera. Now, there's no possibility of a ground loop. And the shield is still grounded just at the receiving end. And since the signal is still capacitively coupled, the receiver can set its own bias level and should be able to recover the signal. So, that's how to interface a coax to the serializer and deserializer. For now, let's drop back to the differential case and look at how the signals actually propagate down the cable. When an AC signal is applied to a transmission line, the transmission line exhibits its characteristic impedance. The capacitors are sized so that the capacitive reactance, that is, the effective resistance to the AC signal, is much lower than the characteristic impedance of the cable. Now, if that's true, then current flows into the cable and out of the cable despite the capacitors at the inputs and outputs, as long as the frequency components of the input signal are high compared to the time constant of the capacitors and the characteristic impedance of the cable, the capacitors will be practically transparent to the signal. What's actually happening at each logic transition is that the logic edge is launched from the transmitter to the receiver and propagates down the cable at some respectable fraction of the speed of light. The logic edge consists of a set of harmonically related frequencies, each of which, unfortunately, 
has a slightly different propagation rate. Just as white light disperses into its constituent colors in a prism, the logic edges tend to smear in time. There's another issue as well. The attenuation along the cable is greater at higher frequencies, so not only do higher frequencies tend to separate from the lower frequencies, they are more greatly attenuated. What does that mean? At the receiving end, it means that it's going to be more difficult to recover a usable clock signal from the incoming data, and that, in turn, means that it's going to be difficult to determine whether a particular bit time represents a zero or a one. The quality of the received signal is frequently measured by using an eye diagram. Think of it this way. Each symbol transmitted over the cable occupies precisely the same amount of time. Let's call that time one unit interval. During the unit interval, there's a portion of the unit interval during which the incoming signal may be in transition from one state to another and another portion of the unit interval during which the incoming signal must be stable. In the case of a one bit per symbol system, the signal must be either in a one state or a zero state. Now, if we draw many signal transitions and overlay them on top of one another so that the start of the unit intervals line up on the left, what forms looks kind of like an open eye. Since we're sampling the signal right in the middle of the opening, we should measure the correct state every time. At the point where the signal crosses zero, we can get an estimate of the time uncertainty, or the jitter, of the signal. Now, ideally, we'd like to see the signal cross the zero line at exactly the same point during each unit interval, but uncertainties in the system make that kind of perfection well, practically unobtainable. Your first line of defense to keeping that eye as open as it can be is the cable. Every time the cable is bent or kinked or crushed, the impedance of the cable varies at that point, and that causes reflections. So do connectors. In fact, any discontinuity in the path from the transmitter to the receiver will cause some distortion, however slight, in the signal quality. For most of Maxim's SIRDES pairs, you have an option. You can use high-quality 50-ohm coaxial cable or shielded twisted pair with a nominal impedance of 100 ohms. For most applications, coax is the better solution. As you can see from this chart, all of the coaxial cables have lower attenuation at a given frequency than any of the STP cables. So... Why would one choose STP as a medium? One reason is flexibility. Look, coax is coax. It's a center conductor and a shield. And if you want to run power over coax, then you're going to pay for power injection and filter components to implement power over coax. And those components are neither inexpensive nor small. With STP, you can use a multi-conductor cable that includes conductors for power and, well, really anything else you want. So you have a choice, coax for better signal integrity or STP for a little more flexibility in power delivery. The point is that Maxim's serializers and deserializers give you both options. In any event, chances are that beautiful, pristine signal that you transmit will be something of a mess when it gets to the receiver. But Maxim has you covered there, too. All of Maxim's serializers have programmable pre-emphasis that boosts the frequencies most often lost along the way so that the received signal has a better chance to be recoverable. And all of Maxim's deserializers have programmable equalization that further helps to fix some of the frequency-based effects that occur along the cable. Now you know how we launch signals onto a cable and then get them back at the other end. Be sure to check out all of the other videos on Maxim's GMSL technology.